Hi, everyone. Welcome to lecture 20 of AI605. Today, we're going to talk about more lang lang large language models. So yeah, it's a very long list of papers. We'll first begin with a few announcements and then do a really quick recap on what we discussed last week. And then we're going to go through about seven papers today, starting from Arbert to GPT-2. And in the next two lectures, we only have two lectures left, by the way. So next week, Monday and Wednesday. So on Monday, we're going to cover GPT-3 and more about the um, what OpenAI has been doing recently including the scaling law paper. So probably gonna cover two papers in, on Monday. And on Wednesday, I'll be talking about really, really recent trend and some conjectures. For instance, there is some conjecture that maybe transformer is not um, say, not really the important thing. Maybe CNN works as well as transformer or maybe even the multi-layer perceptron is as good as transformer if you, tune it correctly and if you have the correct ar architecture. So those things will be the discussions on Wednesday, on next on, on next week, Wednesday, more, I would say, controversial and also really interesting discussions ongoing in the NLP community. So the announcements first, you know that assignment four is due on this Friday, May 28th. 11 p.m. So please make sure to submit if you are planning to submit. But remember that remember that in case you, you, you missed this in the last lecture, we have this new more lenient grading policy that allows you to drop one of the four assignments, the lowest score, of course, so that you can work on only three assignments if you would like to. So and if you if you get really low score on one of the previous assignments, then maybe you can use this assignment four as your replacement for your previous assignments, one of the previous assignments. And we're going to release the assignment one and two grades by next Monday. I'm sorry, I think I mentioned on, I, I mentioned on Monday that this will be this Friday, but the New Year's deadline will be until Saturday or Friday. So it's a bit tight for TAs to complete the grading. So I'm sorry for another another delay. We will try to, we'll make sure to release these by Monday. And please mark answered on GitHub discussions. If they are answered actually, because we're gonna probably use the same discussions for the next semester class, especially because in many cases you're, you ask some question that could be relevant or helpful for the future students. So um, please do this if you haven't. Okay, so let's start with a few recap that on what we discussed on Monday. So Last Monday, we started with nearest neighbor search that will be relevant to your final project if you chose option one. And we moved to, we moved back to post BERT era. So BERT was released in 2018 of October. And we discussed that this basically changed a lot of things in NLP, not only in the NLP, but actually the entire AI community, where now more focus has been on how you can train really big model and then fine tune it or make it appropriate for your target task. And in NLP, basically most NLP tasks could be now achieving still the art or very near to still the art by just using birds and tuning on the target task. So after October 2018, the, the landscape has kind of changed. Before this, it was more about how you can propose better architecture. But 
after that, it now a lot of efforts has been made to make BERT perfect and better. So one of them was how we can make BERT larger for better accuracy or maybe sometimes smaller for more efficiency and then how can we tune it well. Number two was that we wanted to try other pre-training tasks than mask language model. Number three was BERT was based on the transformer architecture and some people try to use other architectures or some variants of transformer. So it's, it's good to keep this in mind because I think most papers that we're going to discuss today will be also related to these three. But um, today we're going to also talk about actually new things that BERT couldn't do. So this will be also covered in today's lecture. So please keep these in mind and let's try to see which of these fit in or which of these actually um, are, which of these actually are, um, yeah, what the uh, match to the each paper. Okay, so we went through ExcelNet and we talked about this was proposed in mid 2019 and they considered BERT as a denoised autoencoder and because they thought that the denoised autoencoder is not as good as autoregressive language model because of the changing input distribution when you mask things. But then the AR is not as good as the denoised autoencoder because it's not bidirectional. So they try to get the best of the both world paradigm by proposing permutation language model. And it's relatively quite um, hard to understand paper actually, um, I think for most readers. If you're interested, I of course recommend you to read it, but then it's relatively hard, a lot of um, um, details, how this permutation language modeling works and how transformer XL is applied. Transformer XL is an improved version of transformer that uses relatively positional encoding so that now your position encoding is not absolute, but relative to what's around it, which makes more sense for most language tasks. And also it adapts segments recurrence mechanism, which is very uh, quite essential for really long documents. Otherwise you will just have to chunk them and consider them separately and somehow merge them or ensemble them at the end. And we talk about Roberta which was like one month after ExcelNet. And I mentioned that Roberta was kind of, I would say, kind of sniping ExcelNet in a sense that they were saying, oh, we, we use just the same architecture as BERT, which means the weights we learned are directly applicable to BERT. But we, we could do better because BERT was under-trained, which means we could make it better by training BERT longer, removing some useless tasks like next sentence prediction. They train on longer sequences. They dynamically change the masking pattern during, during training, which is weird why, I don't know why BERT didn't do that initially. They actually hard coded this into the TF record if you look into the uh, original BERT code. And they did more training. And they were saying that these alone can achieve better accuracy than ExcelNet. And I think, Excel, although ExcelNet, when they were publishing their paper on NeurIPS, they were arguing they had some better, I would say, um, performance in some data sets. But I think it seems to be true that Roberta was as good as ExcelNet. And then we discussed BART, which was originally, um, or it's, I would say, yeah, this is a sequence to sequence pre-training. It's different from the BERT in a sense that BERT only uses the encoder side. We saw the diagrams, the comparison between BERT, BART, XLNet, and GPT-2. So BERT is just using the encoder part of transformer, whereas BART and GPT-3 or GPT-2 or one was using just the decoder side of transformer, whereas BART was using the entire transformer being sequence to sequence 
model. It was still denoising autoencoder like BERT in a sense that they crop the input. So maybe they, not, they, they may not be free from the, the criticism that this creates the disturbance in the input distribution. Um, but they're different from BERT in that because it's sick to sick, they're generating the crack output, the entire crack output, instead of just guessing the words that are masked in BERT. And once they built this sequence, sequence to sequence on some language corpus corpora, then there are two use cases. And it's good to know this because when you're using hugging face, for instance, if you use just BART, then it's usually just encoder only. And you have to actually specifically specify that you want to use BART for conditional generation. And in that case, then it becomes sequence to sequence model that you also import decoder, not just encoder. If you just encode, use the encoder part, then it will be very similar to BERT. When you use decoder, then now you can fine tune this on some sick to sick task. And that was the main point of BERT that you can fine tune summarization, translation, different tasks on BART and they work well, it's achieve really good results. So these were the papers that we discussed up to last lecture. And now let's get into a few more papers that we're going to discuss today. So actually going back to the, the schedule, the outline today. So I want to mention that, so these were the um, last lecture. And you, have, you, know, you see these three Arbert Electra and Mobile BERT. These are really dealing with how can we make BERT or something similar to BERT that's lighter than BERT, but works as well as it. So we're going to talk about really the how can um, I would say how can we make lightweight birds in these three parts, and then we're going to talk about T five, which is kind of similar to Bart, but they have different um, a bit different setup. So we're going to see what's the difference. And what's really important actually in T5 is not the maybe just the original paper. It's, it's also a good paper too, but then uh, what matters to many people was that T5 was able to do some open domain question on closed book QA. We're gonna cover that soon. And layout LM is you're creating a language model for 2D text, actually my bad. So we, we're not gonna discuss M to M. And GP2 is how can we generate text? It's actually, um, early 2019. So the time timeline wise, actually, it, it fits into before XLNet. This was in early uh, 2019. Okay, so going back to the paper. So the first paper that we're going to discuss is Arbert. So Arbert was interested in how can we make BERT more lightweight? And they proposed two parametric reduction techniques. One is factorized embedding parameterization. And number two is cross-layer parameter sharing. So let's talk about cross-layer parameter sharing first. It's very simple. In transformer or BERT, every layer has its own parameters. So if you want to store these, of course, then you will need different stores for each layer. But what Albert was saying is that you might want to sometimes share some layer parameters and just apply it again. So it's very similar to, uh, in a sense, RNN, because if you just apply the same parameters on the, the new inputs, then it's recurrent neural network. So it's RNN, but not on the token axis, but it's on the layer axis. So it's worth noting that actually they had some improvements with this. And factorized embedding parameterization is simply, it's, it, you can think of this as follows. So you have a embedding, and this is suppose that dimension is 
you have book size and some D and you think that this is too large, right? So you basically want to factorize this into two matrices where you have E1, which is some D prime and E double prime, which is B D. So then E is E prime times E double prime. And they were saying that basically if you can factorize this way, some, somewhat similar to this way, then you can basically save a lot of um, computations and also save some space because now then you're in this case, sorry, not V times D. Because in this case, then your memory complexity will be VD prime plus D prime D. And if D prime is sufficiently small, then this can be um, not similar, but that they, it can approach to V plus D, which is definitely um, smaller than O V of D. But if D prime is big, then if it's close to D, then it's not really reducing anything. But that's the really the, the point of the factorization. So this allows you to lower the memory consumption and also increase the training speed of BERT. And also they propose intersentence coherence objective. And with these, they were able to achieve better results on glue, race, and squad with uh, fewer parameters than BERT large. So I think I'll just skip our, I will, can just go through this paper really quickly. I think it's Arbert is this. So this was from Google Research and Toyota TTI in Chicago. And let's see what it does. So let's take a look at a few diagrams. So this is actually interesting because they were trying to compare between um, BERT and Arbert, especially what's the cosine distance between um, the input and output embeddings of each layer. And they were saying that the, the, the I think the left is the, probably the input and the right is output, but they're showing diff similar trends. So wh whichever it is, um, we're seeing that the similarity is very high in the first few layers, but then the difference actually is big between those two when they go to letter layers and the difference bec becomes even, actually, sorry. So what I was trying to say is, um, sorry for the confusion, it's not the uh, left is input and right is output. Le left is L2 distance and the right is cosine similarity. So the different metrics, but uh, there it's both comparing between input and output of each layer. So if if the distance is high, it means then the each layer has very different input, different output compared to the input. And what we're seeing here is that BERT has more, it, it actually changes more when um, than the Arbert large, because um, the output has higher out to distance to the input for each layer than, Ar uh, than Arbert. So that's what they were trying to show. And like, this is basically um, effect of uh, cross layer parameter sharing, because if you try to share some parameters in across layers, then um, I think the difference between input and output becomes more stable and controllable. And I think it's good to look at the uh, results. And we see that when you create Arbert with um, large compared to BERT has much less number of parameters, right? It's almost, it's more than, it's almost 1 20th. That's because of the techniques that we just discussed. And that allows the Arbert to basically increase the, the, the entire size of the model I mean, here the size is not the number of parameters, but because Albert is kind of lightweight version of, of BERT, so 
Bert Large and Arbert Large is equivalent in terms of uh, over, overall specification, but it, um, it uses much less memory. So you can basically increase, you can create a larger BERT with smaller number of parameters. And that allows you to achieve XX large, which is 235 million parameters that compares to BERT small, still smaller, but we see that the accuracy difference is high. Right. But it's also noting that actually, you know, this is around time Roberta was introduced. So they didn't include comparison with Roberta. So it's not super clear if these improvements are coming from really what the Arbert is proposing or is it coming from, for instance, uh, more better training that Roberta has kind of also suggested. So these things are something that you need to look out for when you're trying to use a BERT alternative because they were, the papers were basically being poured out in the very short period of time that it was almost impossible to compare to uh, really recent pre-trained language models. And they just tried to publish paper with whatever, with the whatever they have at the moment, right? So it's really important to really uh, question, oh, we know that Roberta was better than BERT with just better tuning. And then Arberta is not comparing against Roberta. So it's not super clear if where the, this improvement is coming from which I'm not trying to say about is not a um, good contribution, but it's something to look out for and be clear about it if you're trying to use this for your application. So I think that's, that was the main results and um, other things are just more of ablation. So I think we can just skip these, but we know that the uh, training step, step is much faster to, too, because when you're training XX large, you still actually train for a shorter period of time, 32 hours compared to 34 hours. So it is clear that at least our BERT XX large compared to BERT large is, I think we can say that it's absolutely better during training and also test time. Yep, I think other things are more of a analysis that we can skip. That's great. So. Let's come back to uh, the, the slides. And the next example, next paper we're gonna look into is Electra. This was proposed in around the same time, actually. It was also submitted to iClear 2020. iClear, iClear deadline is on um, October, of, October each year. So Electra and the Arbert was concurrent work. So they don't have a comparison to each other. But it's interesting to see, of course, uh, what they do. And actually, Electra was doing, I think, quite smart things. They were saying that they were actually trying to make birds bird better by how can they do this, um, I would say, hidden word guessing more efficiently. And when they efficiently and when they mean BERT is not efficient enough, that's because you mask out only a few words per sentence. And because of that, you have say 100 tokens, but only maybe like 10% or 15% of these tokens are masked, which means only 15 words are masked. And how the BERT is trained is that you only give the loss on those 15 tokens that are masked to guess the correct tokens. So that means then, it's kind of what they're what the paper is saying is that it's kind of wasteful. What what do you do with the other embeddings? What the, what do you do with the embeddings for the tokens that were there, not masked? And that's what they're saying that it's not efficient because Bert trains. Uh, my writing's bad. only 15% of input tokens. And their motivation was how can we increase that ratio so that training can be really efficient. And in order to do that, they what they propose is that instead of masking the words, 
they create a generator. And what they do is they're given the original input, the generator swaps some words with fake, uh, not fake words, but generated words so that you actually create an output, your generator out creates an output that's different from the input, but those words should be very, I would say, fluent enough because you cannot replace any word with any word. For instance, if you, you let's say your input is something like, I am Sam. And this goes into generator and they create a new sentence. By the way, this generator doesn't do sick to sick, but it's more of a token level generation. So they either swap or not. So suppose that you want to swap M, then if this gener generator is not good enough, then maybe you will have something like syntactically wrong word, like I, you, Sam. And this is clearly syntactically wrong sentence. And what the, um, the you the, 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 there's a discriminator that's attached to this output of generator that tries to classify which word is wrong. Or I mean, to be more exact actually, which word has been generated by the generator and not the original input. So in this case, this discriminator will be able to easily know that the U was wrong because it doesn't make sense that uh, you cannot have a I and U back to back in a coherent sentence. So a generator has to corrupt the sum tokens with very plausible alternatives. And then the discriminator's job is to guess which tokens are fake or generated. And you might think that this is quite similar to how the GAN works because GAN also plays between generator and discriminator. Although here the, 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 your objective is not to use the generator as the, as the uh, um, output of the training. In GAN, your purpose is that you create a really good generator so that you can fake the humans. But then in Electra, your purpose is to replace BERT. Basically, how can we, use pre-trained model like BERT, but train better with a better sample efficiency. And you basically use the discriminator as your um, BERT, uh, BERT replacement because this discriminator was trained to classify each token to be either fake or not. And that's what they mean by sample efficient because in this case, then you will be giving the loss for every token in the input. and that they think that that's really important compared to mass language model. And what they're saying is that the gains are particularly strong for small models. So let's look into this paper. Um, actually it's this, so by the way, it's uh, March 2020th because they actually put this on the archive after I clear final draft submission. So they actually put the this paper on the iClear in October. So, and actually here's a, in the, what they're trying to say, basically. They're saying that uh, what they have been doing up to now is that um, this is the flops and this is the some accuracy score on the benchmark glue. And the, what they're saying is Okay, the previous models are following this paradigm, this BERT, right? This paradigm, and there, th and this is because they were using something um, similar to mass language model, or um, they are saying this is basically the limitation of um, existing paradigm. And what they're proposing is that they use this generator to create really good training data for the discriminator, the target model to train, pre-train. And they're saying that this is basically uh, outperforming the previous models. Um, when we actually take the um, flops into account. And I say it flops into account because actually on the right diagram, we see that this actually gap closes as you, you, you you actually have more pre-training flops allowed. For instance, 
we see that uh, when they get up to like uh, Roberta at 100k steps, it's worse than Electra. But when Roberta goes up to 500k steps, then it is clear that it's very comparable to this and this are comparable. And also ExcelNet a bit better, but also comparable. So, but it's clear that the Electra is trying, what's trying to say is that they have a definite um, score versus flop efficiency. And if you want to achieve your pre-training accuracy very soon with small number of flops, which is equivalent to time and money these days, because you can, you your every flop is uh, some, you know, it, it it costs cents on the on the cloud, right? So they're saying, okay, we should go generation based because we can save money given the target accuracy that you want to achieve. And here's the diagram that that I also put on this slide. So they basically um, have original sequence and in order to generate or basically uh, uh, propose plausible token, they actually mask out these words, some words, and then generate what should be going into this mask so that this is a very plausible sentence. But still the two tokens here, the and eight were replaced. And discriminator as well is to find out which are replaced or fake. And um, probably fake is not a good word to use though. I think please use replaced. But anyways, um, but you you see that, okay, it's it, they figured out that it's eight because probably chef cooks meal, not eats meal. This is syntactically correct sentence, but semantically unlikely. Whereas the word the, it's really hard for discriminator to actually figure out, actually impossible for the discriminator to figure out whether the is really original or replaced because actually it was actually original, right? They're the same. It's possible that generator guesses the correct word. Not, it doesn't always generate wrong words or I mean uh, new words that's different from the input. So, but what they're saying is that it's fine. Electra is saying that that's fine. It's fine that even if the, the same word is, although I think I remember that the, if the words are same, then even if it's original, I think they do not give loss for the original, but they just ignore or um, basically, because you, you can know that these are, that the generated words are the same or not. I don't remember that really well, but that, that those are the training details. Okay, so they do that. And then they just basically just try to minimize or train both generator and discriminator at the same time. And that's of course possible only if you actually um, use the output of generator as fixed for discriminator. You cannot flow the gradient through this sample. So it's actually how they train is um, probably that um, I would say it's not exactly, it's not, it's not unbiased. That's, that's, a, that's a good way to say it because if you want to create an unbiased estimator of the loss function, then you will have to think about how you can propagate the gradient through the the, discrim the, the, the generated words, but then they say that we don't um, propagate the discriminant loss through the generator. And of course, it's not impossible because there are several techniques that you can create unbiased estimator of this by using sampling such as reinforce or gumbo soft max. There are several ways, but um, it's good to know that I think I told you this a, a few times already. Unbiased is not always good. I think in many cases, what really matters is variance of the estimator. So you want to first create an estimator that's, that has low variance, and then maybe try to reduce your bias. In this case, it has very low var variance, but then the bias is still um, probably non-zero. Um, so not probably, but it's non-zero. So, but they don't care. It's fine because especially it's it's fine because you're pre-training. You're not. Uh, exactly training towards your target task. 
I mean, discriminator, discriminator training is not your target. What you want to do is you want to use the discriminator for your target tasks, such as question answering. Okay, so they actually do the experiments and I think we can skip the table because I think it's exactly uh, similar to what we saw in the teaser. It does really well when you have small budget of flops or computation and it kind of, I think, levels out and not doesn't show much improvement over other models when you have a lot of uh, budget to spend computation budget to spend. But in many cases, it's very useful to know this, right? And they're saying that their small model is doing really well. And they have really short train time. And I think it's worth noting that, for instance, here, let's compare between these two, right? Bird base, because these are really used a lot. And their accuracy actually is a bit also different. Lectra is much better than bird base on glue, about 3%. And then it's worth noting that the train time for bird base is four days on 16 TPU chips. And it's also the same as the Electra, four days on 16 TPU chips. So it's, it's good, right? Because you have 3% improvement without any train time or hardware, um, I would say, increase. OK, so there are some comparisons, but um, there are you, you note that they're comparing against 100K and 500K because they know that if they're, it, 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 if this increases, then the model's accuracy goes up. Um, but they want it to be fair in, in the sense that, um, you know, we have computation budget, so we want to take that into account. Okay, so please, this read is really easy to read, so please read this paper if you're interested in this work. Um, I think we can skip other things. So let's come back to the slide. So yeah, I think now you get how the Electra works and how this was, I think, uh, what the motivation behind, between, behind the Electra was. And next is mobile BERT. So Electra was good, but still it had still a lot of um, parameters if you want to use BERT in mobile devices, edge devices. and it's clear that there are more and more demand for edge device computing, especially in language maybe. Um, and that's why mobile BERT was, I think, um, drew a lot of attention when this was proposed because if you want to really use this for edge devices and even not edge device, but if you're working on very latency critical applications like search, then it makes sense to, and also if you have a lot of queries then you cannot you know, use like hundreds of GPUs for your service for many companies that's small, not, not big enough, right? So you need to have really lightweight model that can also operate well on CPUs. And mobile board was basically trying to meet that needs. And what they did is actually just trying to compress and accelerate BERT with some bottleneck structures. And they tried to also balance between self-attention and fit forward. And these things allow you to decrease your model size a lot. And at the end, they were able to achieve about 4.3 times smaller model. And it's 5.5 times faster. Probably, I think, I remember this was, I'm not sure it was on GPU or CPU, probably CPU though. But you see uh, then bird base. And bird base is one of the most popular models being used when you have to take the efficiency or memory into account. It's small enough for many devices and it's good enough for many applications. And they did the training by knowledge transfer from bird large to mobile birds. So basically distillation. And I think it's also, I recommend also you to read this if you're interested in how you can create small, super small birds. Okay. So before going into T5, we're gonna have a short break of three minutes. We're gonna come back at 3.15 and then cover the rest of the uh, three papers for the rest of um, lecture. So see you soon.
Welcome back. So I have a question from Hanje. So he asked if the additional tests like next sentence prediction, SOP from Albert, besides MLM necessary for training language models. So I think this is relatively subjective, but personally, I think many people now believe that it's not super important, especially in BERT. Roberta was uh, saying that an SP was not helpful, helpful at all. And it kind of makes sense because uh, personally, I think the task has to be hard enough to learn something and maybe an SP is um, not hard enough or maybe it's not adding any additional value to the mass language model because the MLM is already hard enough that an SP is kind of um, easier problem than MLM. But, uh, and I think the trend is, tr I think what you said is a trend, at least how it's going, that they're, they're actually seeing that the really predicting what the word is, is really the hardest and also most useful training signal. In I think GPT-2 and 3, they also just do that. So um, yeah, but I think it's, I cannot of course say that an SP is not useful at all. I think there is uh, some evidence that, and also the trend that the these auxiliary objectives are not as useful as we thought initially. So did I answer your question? Yeah, no problem. All right, so now let's get into T5. So what does, why, why is it T5? T5 stands for text to text, what was it? So TTT? Something transformer, I forgot. Let's take a look. I think transfer learning with text text transformer. Yeah, so transfer learning. So with text to text tran transformer. So, yep, T T. T, 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 so T5. So what does T5 do? Um, T, what T5 is doing is quite similar to BART actually. So why then is it proposed in, in the first place? And, or I mean, why, well, how does it differ? I think largely two things. One is that it's likely that those two were concurrent work because BART was also proposed in, I think it was June or July in 1999, 2019. So it's only like two or three months after that. So probably Google was working on this when was when Facebook was working on that too. Um, BART is from Facebook and TIFA is from Google. And another dif a key difference is that T5 tries to describe the problem with the at the input and also when they're giving the loss, they also describe the output. So for instance, if you're trying to do machine translation task in the fine tuning stage, you can use BART to fine tune it and just give the input to uh, input and output pairs for the training. But in T5, what they do is that they actually specify what the input is and what, the, what, you're what task you're trying to do. So I'm gonna give an example in the paper soon. Um, and they have a larger scale corpus called coastal clean crawled corpus. So I mean, I'm not saying actually not large, sorry, not large, but um, they basically did some processing on the CC corpus. This is a very famous web corpus that's super large. It's larger than of course, Wikipedia. BERT was only trained on Wikipedia by the way, but T5 was trained on much larger corpus than um, actually most, at least diverse corpus than Wikipedia. And they actually achieved some state of the art in many popular tasks. So let's get into the paper. So it's very long paper, by the way, 67 pages. So 
um, I'll try to really go through important parts. Here, here is it. So that's what I. This is what I meant that um, when they say they put some instruction in the input side, because the translation itself data is just mapping this to this, but then you see that they actually put this at the front, translate English to German. And same for other tasks, all, all, the, all the other task is more dry in the sense that they just write down what the task is, like cola sentence. Cola is a task name. So you might be wondering why, what, what is cola sentence and cola is one of a sentence classification task. And STSB is exactly um, also a name for the task. So, but then summarize is a bit better. They, it's very human readable. And then what really was in the original data set is this. And they basically formulate this as a multitask learning. So they, they try to do multitask learning. They're training the several things at the same time, but also what they're doing is also this can be, um, form, this can basically every NLP problem can be formulated this way. And during free training, model itself is transformer, so it's sick to sick, of course. And they talk about the how they created the corpus. A lot of uh, information. It's very detailed, and they have downstream tasks. Um, a lot of downstream tasks. And they talk about input and output format. So this is an interesting suggestion by the, the T5 again. And they are actually giving the description of what they're trying to do, what the model is being asked to do, because they found that giving this makes the model more, um, I would say input distribution wise, it's better. And also model more generalizable. And um, for instance, I think probably they don't have examples, but I think that's quite clear given what we saw in the initial diagram. And they basically does, do, does this experiment with a quite large model. So they actually have a few few um, sizes. Where is it? Um, yeah, I wanted to show this though, yeah. So um, they, how they do is that they basically mask out some phrases and then the input becomes this masked input quite similar to BART, right? And they create the output, but the output is not, in BART you're trying to create the entire output, but in here you're trying to create the output by just specifying what you are trying to guess or what uh, you were asked to, to guess. So it's a bit different. The target it's more, I would say short then shorter than the how BART was pre-trained. Um, I wanted to show you um, results, but the paper is super long. <laughs> it's very long, right? They did a lot of experiments, definitely. So they put it together finally, right? So here we go. All right, so they have several models and they actually, small base, large, I think they are comparable to birds and uh, 3 billion means it's uh, th uh, 3 billion uh, parameters. Actually, it's larger than bird, bird though. So they have the information here. Um, yeah, I don't know where they are, but think of these two. So 3 billion is much larger than BERT large, right? It's 10 times larger. So BERT large was 330 million. 
and now it's going to 3 billion in T53B and they do even larger model, which is 11 billion. So this is 10 times and this is uh, four times. So basically what they tested is 40 times bigger model at the end. And they were saying that this is doing pretty well, uh, especially compared to the previous best. And maybe it makes perfect sense because this their model is much larger than the previous models. And I think T5 or um, uh, this was actually the largest model back then in late 2019. And they could do this with uh, their internal TPU chips and the really fast intra GPU network. And they even did, uh, wait, yep, never mind. So, yep, so I think it's a very long paper, but I think you get the point. Hopefully, they made really long, a really big model with a bit different way of formulating the task a more, I would say, generalizable way because you can formulate any NLP problem into sick to sick like how T5 did. And they were showing super for, uh, better, much better performance than the previous best result when they increased this model size to about 40 times bigger than BERT. So that's, I think, the final message. I think up to that, up to that, up to that is it's, it's Great, but not so, I would say, surprising, right? Because we saw already that BERT, base, and large, when they go from BERT, uh, base to large, the accuracy increased a lot. So I think many people expected that, oh, yeah, then probably if you increase that by like 40 times, then probably you will do better than BERT large. And uh, how you do this text-to-text -text format is convenient, but it's still you have to fine tune models. and. Okay, so it doesn't really give super new insight. Maybe some people might think, but I think really the really the interesting um, discovery made by T5 is actually a follow-up paper, which was January 2020. So about uh, two months after this paper was released, three months after, and they introduce the concept of closed book QA, and that's very critical. Actually, that's very important because Actually, this is also aligns a, a bit with the uh, GPT-2, what we're gonna talk about very soon. But what they do is the paper is saying that if you, once you train this T5, which is basically um, sick to sick kind of mass language model, but sick to sick, not, um, not a um, discriminative way. And if you fine tune this on question and answer pairs, but not without looking at the um, any evidence documents, then we are seeing some evidence that this model can actually answer your question without looking up the documents. And that was very surprising because actually it was surprising also in GPT-2, but the accuracy was very low, but then in T5, they show that when they increase the model size really big, the accuracy becomes very comparable to state of the art. And that's very surprising because it means that you don't have to retrieve any documents. For instance, if you're doing your final project, option two, option one, it means you don't have to retrieve the evidence documents. You don't have to do any search. This model can just look up knowledge in your parametric space and get the answer back. And so that's why sometimes people call these, this is like parametric model as compared to non-parametric model that retrieve and read is really based on, because in this case, you have a, some really big knowledge base that you're searching over. So this will be really, I think, important uh, discovery because it means that you can actually store facts, some factual information inside the model not just how you resolve task, but really concrete factual information like someone someone was born in some year or some someone was the president of some nation, etc. So very it was very, I think, uh, shocking uh, in that they were able to really achieve very close accuracy to state of the art. Although there were also some criticisms, it's worth noting that because they were saying that some people were saying that T5 can only do um, work well on only some overlapping questions between training and test. 
it's some uh, it's a paper that you might also want to look at. I didn't actually put that on today's slide, but uh, I might want to discuss that I think in the next Wednesday class. Okay, so and then another paper that I wanted to mention, although it's a bit different uh, flavor, is layout LM. And what they were saying here is that language model for documents, it will be different if you're talking about not one dimensional text document, but semi structured documents like Wikipedia or even document image. And these are especially important if you're doing something on top of OCR. Suppose you want to do information extraction from name card. I think you're using some, some of you have used the application called Remember in Korea. And what they allow you to do is that you take a picture of name card and then um, the application actually extracts information from the name cards. And if you want to do this with BERT, it's not impossible, but then the problem is that BERT always assumes the input text is one dimensional but there is a lot of information contained in the spatial layout of the name card. And name card is relatively simple documents, but then if you're dealing with more complex documents, then you're talking about these implicit information that's really important for people to understand documents. And if you just serialize that into one dimensional text to use it for BERT, then your model is missing a lot of information or losing information to begin with. So the layout LM was saying that it's important to actually account for 2D text. I'm not going trying to I'm not going to go into details, but I, it's worth mentioning that layout LM performs better than BERT by taking the positional information into account. And also, I want you to take a look at the um, bros by Naver. Uh, this was actually um, in 2021. Uh, this year, I'll say 2020 actually, submitted to uh, iClear, which was in October last year. And um, I know this paper also, a full disclaimer is that this paper uh, was by members in, uh, in my team when I was a neighbor. So uh, I know what the work is about and I think um, it's, it's pretty good paper. So if you're interested in this kind of um, literature, then it's really definitely worth taking a look because it, it does really good summarization and what it proposes is also very sound. I'm not sure they open sourced it yet though. And there were a lot of many, many multilingual models. Of course, why not? Because we want to be able to use these not just for English, but also other languages. And it's worth noting that if you put M, it doesn't actually mean that, um, it actually means that it can take care of a lot of different languages. And it's actually, very English centric, if you think about it, because uh, it means that if, if you put M, then you're trying to cover every language, including English. But if you don't put anything, you're just covering English. So, which is not fair because you might want to have a dedicated model for Korean, for instance, not M. So you want Corbert instead of Mbert. So SKT developed some uh, Korean BERT, Korean BART models and they release these. So it's worth taking a look at those models if you want to do that for Korean. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, of course, um, worldwide, people are more interested in, I think, English or I'll say multilingual, not just one language model. Um, so when you see M, then probably it means that it's covering like 100 languages and trying to cover like 100 languages is very inefficient in many ways, accuracy wise, and also the vocab size increases so much. Um, a model may be fine, but then the problem is that the, in order to encode every kind of language, then you have to have a really large vocab size and vocab size basically means you have to have, you have to store large embedding matrix. So model size becomes really large. In some cases, I think MT5, the vocab size, vocab embedding is larger than model itself. So you see how large this can be. So it's very inefficient, but it's very convenient though, right? Because you can just use this for any language, any um, web page on the, on, the, on the internet, trying to process them. And they are the, the, the two goals, your, um, your first choice to really consider if you want to develop some application really fast. 
we can go into the um, um, hugging face and see which model you can use really uh, off the shelf. And I'm going to conclude today's lecture with GPT-2. And actually GPT-2 uh, chronicle, chronically comes before Excelnet, BART, or Roberta, because this was actually in the early 2019. Um, but, but so actually this was actually submitted and published in ICML. But, um, but it's worth mentioning that what uh, GPT was, has been doing in the literature of large language model in um, recent three or four years. So GPT-1 was proposed in 2018, June. And this was 2019, February. And this was 2020, June. So it's about like a year or maybe a bit longer um, um, gap between each paper. And then we see that GPT-1 was actually pioneer, 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 pioneering the transfer learning by fine tuning only without any additional architecture. Elmo, if you remember, was actually doing the um, really more of a contextualized embedding, but you had to have the target model attached on top of the, the contextualized embedding. So it was kind of start of the fine tuning, but not exactly about um, one model for everything. They were actually requiring very target specific, specific model for your target task. But GPT-1 was the, I think, one of the first model to suggest that you can use, just use the transformer decoder for every task that you're interested in. Or, or, of course, but the really the problem of GPT-1, the reason why it was not so popular was because it didn't really show good performance on many classification or question answering tasks. And I think it's mainly because GPT-1 was um, all regressive. It's not bi-directional. So BERT was mask language model with transformer encoder, which is bi-directional. So it was clear that BERT could do better than GPT-1 by the limitations of GPT-1. But they were proposing that concept. And of course, between GPT-1 and 2, the, there was BERT, which was in um, 2018 October. And then GPT-2 came out in like three to four months after BERT. And what GPT-2 was proposing is they were able to do very fluent text generation with a large model. So of course, this, is, this model is not as large as T5, but then it was large enough that many people cannot even actually uh, reproduce it, even if the model was um, open sourced. And they show really remarkable coherent passage uh, article generation. They actually gave, I think you might remember this like uh, from some Facebook posts saying that, oh, GP2 can do really, create really fake news article really well by just giving a few first words, like say for instance, like title. And then uh, I think you also probably remember that OpenAI was saying they were not trying to open source this initially because they were worried that this might create too many fake news articles. Um, I think that was like a GPT-2. And what we're gonna discuss next lecture is GPT-3, which is now they're changing the, the if GPT-1 was trying to say, um, okay, we can just fine tune and fine tuning should be really all you need. Uh, we don't have to do target specific um, model creation. And GPT-2 was more about, oh, generation works really well if the model is really, really large. Then GPT-3 was saying that um, it's basically yours. It's saying you don't even have to fine tune. You, you don't have to even fine tune for your target task. You can just do in-context learning for your target task. And another amazing thing is that you can do this with really few examples. And another is that your generation will be really good which they learned from GPT-2 that it can do very many tasks, not just classification or question answering, these some disc discriminative tasks, but really creative things. And that's what we're gonna discuss next Monday.
with uh, also why how OpenAI Open was very confident that if they can spend like millions of dollars on increasing the model size, then they can achieve something remarkable, which is uh, some paper that they published uh, before GPT-3. So I'll see you on next Monday. Thanks.